Welcome everybody. I'm so excited to have you here with me. Um, and also with me tonight, we have the Historical Society. We have four wonderful presenters um, to share with us some history of the area. Um, I don't have any other announcements, so we can just go ahead and get started. First up is Joel. Thank you, Kara, and good evening. My name is Joel Olson, and I'm a volunteer with the Historical Society. I do some cataloging and some uh, research in other areas, and I've been asked to review the history of the churches in Oregon. A little context. This past fall, the volunteer staff at the museum had a roundtable discussion about diversity in Oregon. That word diversity has a number of contemporary associations, and the very word even raises hackles among liberals and conservatives alike. There's even some effort in the part of the schools and the businesses here in town to address the issue and to see that the community embraces more diversity. Within the history of the churches of Oregon, I discovered that we have had diversity in this town ever since the second church was organized. And tonight I'd like to touch on that diversity in our churches from a historical perspective. Before that, though, let me point out that the museum has rather extensive files on our four larger and older congregations in the village, and we have a growing file of historical information on the four newer churches as well as on the Methodist and Lutheran congregations in Brooklyn. So it would be impossible for me to explore all the various histories in 15 minutes. Anyone wishing to dig a little deeper into this history can come by the museum. You're welcome to do so and examine our files. But the topic of diversity and variety in the Oregon churches is a more manageable topic for this evening. So let's begin. The very earliest settlers in Oregon area were Yankees who brought their church affiliation with them. Think of that picture postcard scene of a quaint New England village with a crisp white congregational church on the village green in the center of town. The early settlers here brought their church, established it, located it, not on the green, but on Main Street, but as close to the business district in the center of town as possible. Traditionally, the New England congregational churches were composed of professional and civic and business leaders, the upper echelon of society, as it were, and that seems to be the case here in Oregon, based on a cursory review of the names associated with the first church. So the first church to be organized here in the village was a congregational church. That was in 1845. The next year, those church elders decided to change affiliation, and the first Presbyterian church was born in our town. And in 1855, these Presbyterians built their very first building. And by 1895, they required a new facility which served them in their downtown location on Main Street until 2011. Next came the Methodists. Historically, the Methodist denomination has made inroads on the American frontier by having circuit riding preachers take the gospel out of the churches, out to the pioneers. And so actually, the very first religious service of any nature in this area was preached by a Methodist circuit rider, ironically, in Runney's Bar Room in 1842. 
when enough Methodists in church in town wanted to have a church, they approached the Presbyterians and the Methodists helped build that first building on Main Street. This may have been economically prudent at the time, but Presbyterians and Methodists make strange bedfellows. Sociologically, these two denominations are a vastly different temperament and a sense of purpose. Presbyterians typically provide necessary stability to the community, while Methodists are very good at outreach to the disenfranchised and to the needful. And so, within the very first generation of the village of Oregon, diversity began to emerge in the religious community, and the choice was even more obvious when the Methodists built their own church in 1862, just a block north of the Presbyterians. And they too, the Methodists, stayed put on Main Street until 2006. Then, about 30 years later, came the Lutherans, the Danes in particular. They first gathered together out in the town of Rutland, but they moved their congregation into Oregon in 1896. Not on Main Street, like the others, but these Danes found a location in a residential area, they built their sanctuary, and they worshiped in their own national language. So here again, with a new church in town, was a bit more religious diversity for our village residents, but the doors were hardly open to English-speaking people. If and when you could get past that language barrier, you discovered the worship was formal with a fixed liturgical pattern. But even so, within the congregation, there was a great desire to be a part of mainstream community Oregon life. And so accordingly, the use of Danish language was dropped by 1936, and, while, and meanwhile, the name had been changed from Danish Lutheran to St. John's Lutheran. A new brick church was being built by these Lutherans on Washington Street, and chicken dinners for the public helped raise necessary funds. In time, chicken gave way to turkey with all the trimmings. And the annual smorgasbord was born in 1956. And for 64 years, the community filled both the fellowship hall and their own bellies. With so many congregation members having to work for the dinner, this outreach endeavor brought mostly outsiders into the building. No longer just for the church, now the proceeds supported missions on a local, regional, and even an international scale. And now recently, the smorgasbord has given way to Lenten fish fries, with still more diversity of church dinners, at least, being available to all. By then, on the other end of town, again not in the center, the Roman Catholics had built their first village church. Like the Lutherans, originally the Catholic building was out of town on what is now Highway M. There was an Irish community in the town of Fitchburg and this parish served their needs. A map of the village from 1885 shows a Catholic church on the corner of North Main Street and Netherwood Road and they have been at that location ever since. The presence of a Catholic church added yet more diversity to the village. Until the Second Vatican Council in about 1963, the Catholics, like the early Lutherans, worshiped in a foreign language. Of course, the parish affairs and the fellowship were in English, and that helped uh, integrate the parish into the lighter, larger life of Oregon. 
And then a disastrous fire in 1961 elicited more community support marked by over five fire companies coming together to battle the blaze. Trusting that the parish was a solid part of the community, Holy Mother of Consolation rebuilt on that very same site. They embraced liturgical reforms and they opened their doors to the community. For years, this congregation, this church, hosted the annual Thanksgiving service in Oregon. Outsiders got inside and they discovered that the Catholics were pretty hospitable people after all. And so, by the, before the end of the 20th century, Oregon boasted three vibrant churches right on Main Street. Surely we didn't look like a New England village with its lone church on the green, but we feel we were better because there was more diversity emerging of religious experiences available to the townspeople. Well, changes came to the community churches when in 1980, St. John's Lutheran began to move its church home north to Netherwood Road. At that time, there were open fields on the north and the west, and some questioned the wisdom of such a, a distant location. But now, 40 years later, St. John's is smack in the middle of several good neighborhoods. Then, like the Lutherans, the Methodists outgrew their building and in 2006 chose to go west to what is, was touted as the future city center area. And lots of new construction in the neighborhood has vindicated that decision. And before long, in 2011, the Presbyterian Church relocated to the North Bergamot area. Now, a visitor driving through Oregon on Main Street will see only one church building on the way. But there are two newer churches on Main Street. They're in storefront locations. They're easily overlooked. The Vineyard Community Church is downtown next to the appliance store. And the Community of Life Church meets in a strip mall on the north end of town. When St. John's vacated its Washington Street building, Faith Lutheran, a more conservative group, established itself there and has been growing for 42 years. And across the freeway from St. John's, Hillcrest Bible Church has been reaching out to younger families and to the youth for just about as long. So you see, within the village of Oregon, we have a diversity of eight churches of varying size and age and affiliation. All of them are involved in outreach into the community with daycares and preschools, with helpful programs to those in need, as well as proclaiming the gospel to all. And then add to this the Brooklyn and Methodist Lutheran churches, and we have 10 different con Christian fellowships at hand in the Oregon School District. So the history of the churches of Oregon reveals that there has been at least one kind of diversity here for nearly 175 years. But now our national religious culture is changing. The importance of denominational identity seems to be receding and a seeker into the uniqueness of the various churches is more likely to find a degree of sameness today. And this may be true in part to maybe intermarriage between Protestants and Catholics, or having the freedom to change affiliations and to attend where families and especially youth are being ministered to. As our society in general, and our village of Oregon works toward a healthier experience of tolerance and understanding, we can see that we actually have it within our civic DNA to embrace multiculturalism and diversity, 
whether that's of political expression or lifestyle choices or social viewpoints or economic realities. Yet, prejudice and fears of what and who are different also lurks in the body politic. So, we should remember that the churches have always been in the business of bridge building, of value as education, and of reconciliation. And as the historical society celebrates the history of our churches, we further embrace their mission to help make Oregon a vibrant and more positive, responsive community in which to live and to raise our families. Thank you. Do you have any questions? There is one online. Yikes. Um, when did the Buddhist temple come to the area? And the same question for the Hindu temple off of Fish Hatch. I'm aware that the Deer Park uh, Buddhist monastery was in existence in 1981, when, uh, in 1986, when I lived in this community at that time and attended a service there. It was somewhat developed, but still somewhat rustic, so I'm thinking that it perhaps uh, began its life on Schneider Road there in the early 80s. I did check the website. There is one, and they have quite a bit of history about their facility there. There's also a website for the Hindu temple, the uh, Hindu faith community that is up on Fish Hatchery Road. And again, their website would give you some basic information uh, of their own existence there as well. I didn't cover, uh, there's also a Cambodian uh, Buddhist uh, center just north of all the uh, roundabouts north of McDonald's. I didn't cover those or other uh, world religions. I kept my focus on the Christian churches in the area. Whenever you're ready. Go yep. okay. Good evening. I'm Joanne Swenson, and I too am a volunteer at the Oregon Area Historical Society and Museum. And as I've learned from volunteering at the Oregon Museum, everyone has a story. We have the good fortune of having many family files at the museum that have been compiled through the clippings and from families who have shared their family history with us for the benefit of generations to come. We even have added an additional filing cabinet so that we can hold even more family histories. So if you've explored your genealogy or have family albums with pictures or have documented your family history, we urge you to share those with us. Today my presentation will focus on the importance of music in our daily lives, and specifically the story of the Steinhauer sisters. They were popular local musicians in the late 40s, excuse me, the late 30s, the 40s, and beyond. So these are the Steinhauer sisters, the singing Steinhauer sisters, Anne, Dorothy, Ellen, and Teresa. Many of you may not know of the Steinhauer family, but if you've lived in the Oregon area for a while, you will likely recognize two of them by their married names, Anne Bossingham and Dorothy Freitag. A few years ago, I sat down for a visit with Dorothy Freitag at her home on Kirstead Lane. Also present there were her daughter Diane and friends of the Steinhauer family, Winnie Lacey and Kate Purcell. We started our conversation with a bit of family history. Anne, Dorothy, Ellen, and Teresa are the children of Urban Arthur Steinhauer and his wife, Ellen Nell Byrne. Other children in the family were Mary, William, Vincent, 
and Martha, who was stillborn. Irvin Steinhauer was a farmer. The family lived on a farm west of the village of Oregon in the area of County Highway D in Vasco. The Steinhauer children attended the Colby Country School, located at the corner of Highway D and Judd Road, west of the village of Oregon. G.R. Colby donated the land for the school, and the school was organized in 1886. Laura Williamson was the teacher there and was paid $25 a month. In 1938, the school closed and the pupils were sent to Oregon. Early residents of the district were Colby, Williamson, Fincher, Clark, Ace, Steinhauer, and Strife. Dorothy chuckled a bit as she recalled an amusing childhood memory of school days in the country school. It was a tradition for country school children to put on a class play. One in particular that Dorothy remembered was a story about a farmer and wife. Betty Ace played the, the farmer's wife. Dorothy had the role of playing a cow. I'm pretty sure if it had been a musical, though, the Steinhauers would have had a leading role in that play. At home, Dorothy recalled after their chores were done, she and her sisters used to sing on the back porch until it was time to go to bed. Neighbors who were still milking the cows would listen to them sing. They were all yodelers, and Teresa especially was very good. Even brother Bill thought they were pretty good. Singing was a family pastime at the Steinhauer house. They also enjoyed singing at church. It was something they continued to do as adults for many years to come. They sang at St. William's Church in Keolai and at the Oregon Catholic Church picnic. They were frequently asked to sing at local events like show night in Belleville. They performed at events in Verona and even as far away as Beaver Dam. Singing at barn dances and barn raisings and horse shows were other opportunities for them to perform. They also performed at the shows that were held at the Oregon Opera House and played the guitar. Among the clippings in Dorothy's scrapbook was one in which the sisters performed at the Dane County Legion reunion that was held in Cross Plains. The article in the newspaper clipping states, and I'll quote, music by the Steinhauer Sisters Quartet won the hearts of all those present. The girls, Ellen, Anne, Dorothy, and Teresa Steinhauer are versatile singers and yodelers of high caliber, end quote. A special event in their music careers was a chance to perform on the WLS Barn Dance radio show that was broadcast from Chicago, Illinois. It nearly didn't happen for them because their dad insisted that they could only go if he went with them. However, at that time their mother was in the hospital and their dad couldn't take them. But with the help of their neighbor, Ray Williamson, who made satisfactory arrangements for them so that they were able to get to Chicago and perform on the radio show. Teresa Steinhauer was only 12 years old when she was hospitalized and after more than a week in the hospital, she died from a ruptured appendix. Teresa was born on March 4, 1927. She was in the sixth grade and was very popular with her schoolmates. Ellen, Anne, and Dorothy continued on as a trio. Appearing as the Steinhauer Trio, they were among 50 acts that appeared on the WHO Home Talent Show that was held in the city auditorium in Stoughton. Ellen Steinhauer met Elwood Johnson while she was working in the kitchen at the Stoughton Hospital. Elwood delivered the milk to the hospital. They were married shortly before Elwood was deployed by the US Navy to serve in World War II in October 1941. Ellen was employed by various businesses, including the Stoughton Shoe Factory, IKI Manufacturing, she was head housekeeper for the North Chalet Motel and volunteered for many years at the Stoughton Senior Center. She loved to travel and with the Weekenders group, visited many places including Alaska, Nova Scotia, and Branson, Missouri. Ellen left the trio after she married. Anne and Dorothy continued on as a duet to sing and appear at many local events and, fun and functions. Dorothy Steinhauer, Dorothy Steinhauer was born on July 10, 1923. She and Bernard Freitag were schoolmates and neighbors. He lived just down the road from the Steinhauers. Bernard moved to Dayton to his grandfather's farm when he was in second grade, but eventually moved back to his home neighborhood when he was in the eighth grade. 
Bernard and Dorothy were married in 1945. Bernard farmed for over 40 years, but in his spare time he enjoyed playing in a band. He was a noted trumpeter. He began playing in the 1940s with his own band called Bernard Freitag and his Mountain Melodians. He joined the well-known Sammy Eggum Band, performing on the popular Dairyland Jubilee program, which was broadcast on Wausau TV and also on WKOW 27 for 11 years. He also played with the Irv Hale and the Kurt Strandley's Polka Bands and with Simpson's Nighthawks Band. Bernard continued playing until ill health befell him. He and Dorothy were married for over 50 years. Bernard passed away in May of 1996. Their children are Diane Vinnie, who is now deceased, David and Donna. Dorothy and, and Bernard were both talented musically, and there is no coincidence that their musical talent was passed on to the next generation. David performs with the Back 40 Band, playing guitar and singing along with another local singer, Heather Ames Newton. They have performed at the Hideaway Acres Supper Club in Benton, Wisconsin. They appear regularly at the Janesville Moose Club and the, Mo and the Monroe Moose Club, as well as the Madison DFW on Cottage Grove Road in Madison. Locally, they can be found often performing at the Main Street Music in Brooklyn, Wisconsin, and frequently they give performances right here at the Oregon Senior Center. Anne Steinhauer was born on July 7, 1921. She, she married James, better known as Jay, Bossingham on February 24, 1945 in Norfolk, Virginia. They raised four children, James, better known as Jim, <coughs> Kathleen, William, who is better known as Bill, and Annette. Anne worked alongside Jay operating Jay and Anne's Tavern on North Main Street in Oregon. It was famous for the Jay Burger and it was the best hamburger in the area. Jay was a fabulous cook, and no one who visited the Bossingham home ever left without having a bite to eat. When the opportunity arose for Jay and Ann to expand their business, they purchased the building just to the north of the tavern and set up a liquor store and gift shop. They operated a business in Oregon for over 20 years. Jay and Ann were active in the community. Jay and Ann were willing volunteers and could always be counted on to help out with anything that was needed. Ann was even one of the judges for a beard contest held during the 19, excuse me, during Oregon's 125th anniversary celebration. Ann and Dorothy can be seen here behind the counter of the gift shop. Jay went on to become a real estate sales agent for Allen Realty until his death on March 12, 1980. Jay was a member of the Oregon Masonic Lodge, the Zora Shrine, Lakeland Shrine, the Oregon Chamber of Commerce, and the Madison Elk Club. Jay served in the U.S. Navy during World War II and was a member of the Oregon American Legion Post. Anne passed away on May 17, 1998. She also passed along her musical talent to the next generation. Son Bill plays in his own band, playing old and new country music and oldies rock music. Jim took part in the Nutcracker production that was an annual event in Madison for years. Browsing through Dorothy's scrapbook, it's abundantly obvious that the Steinhauer family enjoyed a multitude of friends. They enjoyed the company of each other as a family and sharing time with all their friends and participating in inter entertaining activities. Pictures of a group appear in the, scrap in the scrapbook of them sharing a day at, Levels, at Devil's Lake, at Vilas Park, or on road trips. They were all part of the 2020 Card Club that met monthly at each other's homes and often spent vacation time together. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions? Good, no questions. Thank you. All right. Did you want to sit with Sam? Oh. Hello, and welcome to the history of the Oregon Fire Department, a view of the first 97 years. My name is Dina Zentner, and I have the honor of being on the Oregon Historical Society Board, 
and the Oregon Area Fire EMS District Commission. I'm going to invite our viewers to count just how many times I use the word first in this presentation. And you will see why there are so many first in the Oregon Fire Department. If I stutter, that only counts as one. So. <laughs> What would you come to your mind if you heard the words, fire, fire, shouted loudly? You'd likely snap to attention and perhaps ready your phone for a 911 call. Am I right? It would take only minutes for first responders to arrive on the scene, immediately assess the situation and execute their specialized skills. And with today's technology, it's hard to guess how many people would already be looking at pictures and videos posted on Facebook. While well, hearing the words fire, fire in the young village of Oregon 150 years ago, you would have immediately begun to loudly repeat the shouting to every person in hearing distance. This would arouse the whole community to the necessity of action. Every person in the community would share the responsibility and obligation of extinguishing the fire. This is not a picture of any of the Oregon residents. Some of these I had to look for online. As quickly as possible, water was obtained at the nearest source, usually from individual wells and pumped by hand. Water was pumped into receptacles, pails, cans, buckets, anything that could hold water. Then passed hand to hand from one person to the next in the form of a human water transport. I bet you all know that this was called the Bucket Brigade. The first recorded major fire in the young village of Oregon occurred in the fall of 1864. 158 years ago on the west side of Main Street across from the public square. A store owned by Gilbert Johnson burned to the ground. Near the same location six years later another major fire destroyed a general store and post office. And the fires continued. Three years later five buildings on the North Main Street were destroyed. The date of this large fire was July 4th, 1873. Seven years later, Isaac Howe's Drug Store, H.J. Smith's Furniture Store, and Case and Warner General Store were destroyed. At the time, the village was experiencing a period of healthy growth. The increase in population and the increase in fires confirmed the need for better fire protection. Records indicate that around 1886, the village invested $150 in a number of fire extinguishers that were placed on street corners. And I found this online after doing some research and found it interesting. Did some research and believed that this was something like might have been seen. And I found it especially interesting up on top. It says a child can use it. <laughs> so it gave me the impression that anybody back in the bucket for big times that, were, that was there and had hands and could move, they were involved in the fire rescue too. In February of 1888, the first reference to the existence of a fire department was made in the village minutes. They recorded the purchase of two ladders, two hooks, six pipe poles, and ropes. The first fire chief was Hartley Criddle, pictured here. In 1895, part of an old wooden schoolhouse was moved to the present site of Maria's Pizza. This became the village hall. 
The fire department occupied the downstairs part of the building, while the upstairs was the village meeting room and the polling place. The belfry held the bell to sound the alarm for fires. The tower and water main system went into effect in 1889 and 1899. A number six hose cart was purchased in January of 1900 for the amount of $454.75. In December of 1911, an automatic fire alarm system was installed and operated by the Oregon Telephone Company. The old village hall and fire station building moved to the site of the present day community building in 1915. At that time, a fire siren was mounted on the crossbeam of the water tower. In 1921, the annual salaries of the fire department officers were as follows. Chief, $20. Treasurer, $5. Secretary, $10. And fireman, $5. In 1925, the department numbered some 40 members. In 1925, the department's first fire truck was purchased for $8,000. This was also the first fire truck in Dane County. It had a Dodge chassis and four cylinders and was equipped with a 300-gallon water tank. In 1926, a ladder truck was then added. In 1940, a new village hall was built. Interestingly, it consisted of a library, a kindergarten, a first grade classroom, city offices, auditorium, kitchen, jail, police and fire departments, and stalls for the fire engines and equipment. Also in 1940, a Ford tank truck was purchased by the towns of Dunn, Rutland, Fitchburg, and Oregon. This was the first department tanker used in rural areas and the first tank truck outside of Milwaukee County. In 1947, the Oregon Fire Department purchased its first oxygen mask. In 1949, the Oregon firemen gave the first demonstration of wetter water. This is a wetting agent added to water to break down the surface tension. Oregon was one of the first Class A approved rural fire departments in the state, which gave the department credit on rural fire insurance. In 1955, Oregon had the first instructor school for state instructors on basic firemanship. Seven Oregon firemen qualified and instructed other fire departments. In 1958, five fire alarm telephones were put into use. The telephone number was 5 3 113. Three of these phones were in the business places and two were in the homes of the firemen. The fire department soon improved its communications in another important way. In 1959, the fire department sent a letter to the FCC for radio based licenses. Oregon became the first <laughs> fire department in the state authorized by the FCC to operate and transmit base and mobile radio on its newly assigned fire frequency. And we've seen this picture before and heard the Catholic Church in Oregon was completely, sadly destroyed by fire in 1961. A $700 memorial consisting of first aid equipment, uh, 
um, ropes and a power jack was presented to the Oregon Fire Department. And then in 1963, the village of Oregon, the towns of Oregon, Dunn, Rutland, and Fitchburg joined together and, re and created a fire district. And today, the village of Oregon and town of Oregon, Rutland, and Dunn belong to the fire district that protects 44 square miles. So I invite you to visit both the Oregon Historical Society and the Oregon Area Fire EMS District. The Historical Society offers a really interesting display of artifacts and contains detailed information about um, the past fire chiefs very well put together. And the fire department has interesting historical pieces and a display near the front door. And I encourage you to visit that. That's where I got this hat. This is an authentic vintage hat that I wanted to show you. I don't have a date on it, although it says it's hard boiled. And, <laughs> and it's made in Mexico. I, I do know from some experience that it's much lighter weight than today's equipment. It's really durable and heavy, where this is feather light. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I hope that you explore both locations. Do we have any questions? No questions? OK. Thank you. I'm a, I'm yep. a, excuse me. I'm also set to. <coughs> excuse me. Good evening. My name is Gerard Peeler. I was a police officer for the village of Oregon from 1978 to 2010. I am currently am a board member for the Oregon Historical Society. I have been asked to talk to you tonight about the history of the Oregon Police Department. In checking with the museum and our current police department, they had records and files from the initial um, site for the, when they uh, first had their first police officer, and those files were <coughs> accidentally destroyed. So I had to dig hard and long to come up with tonight's um, talk. So, bear with me on that. If some of the dates and times are wrong, come and see me. You don't know my address. Okay. <laughs> so when I started looking into the history of the police department, I kept asking myself, why do we have police departments to begin with? Oregon asked the same questions. Countries and nations had guards, armies. They had their own protection. And and then, when they wanted something, they fought for it, and fought for it until the death. I did some more checking, and it's believed to be the first police department in the world was in the 1800s by Sir Robert Peel, and he established the department in England, and the officers at that time were called Bobbies. We took the same um, way of looking at how a police department was uh, designed by England and was brought to the United States. It was basically under their British rule, well, we have our own. We have constables, sheriffs, police officers, and so on. The actual definition of a police is a civil force of a national or local government responsible for prevention and detection of crime and maintenance of public order. They had to have prisons in America first before they even thought about police de departments. You probably think, well, well, why? If they arrested somebody, where are they going to put them? They could put them in jail, but if they did something serious, they needed to put them in prisons also so that they worked hand in hand with the local governments, the counties, and the state. <clears throat> it is believed that the first prison 
in America was built in Philadelphia in 1773. America, once again, had sheriffs, constables, so they needed places to um, put the arrested people, so they had to build jails besides the prisons. So that's where the local counties and so on had to have their own. Out west, they had jails that you can see, and I don't know if you remember watching Gunsmoke when you were growing up and so on, and if you're um, too young, look, it, all you have to do is watch on television now, Gunsmoke's on there. But the, the counties and the uh, cities did have their own jail, and they actually held them until they um, had the judge come, and then they were sentenced, and then they were sent to the prisons. Wisconsin became a state in 1848. Waupon was the first prison in 1851. That's where it was built. Cities, villages were being developed all over the state. Village of Oregon was no exception to that, and it was incorporated in 1883. Wisconsin, like I said, built the first prison in 1851, but closer to Oregon, the Dane County Sheriff's Department had their own jail. A gentleman by the name of Nathaniel Parkinson was the first sheriff in Dane County. They needed a jail because if uh, the local villages and cities didn't have one, they would then take them to the Dane County Jail. Well, Mr. Parkinson owned the bakery on the first floor. Guess what was on the second floor? The jail. This time, Oregon Police Department took this and took it very serious. So when they arrested somebody, they couldn't hold them here. They took them to the Dane County Jail. Of what I found out in 1881, September 4th, a general election took place where the village of president was elected along with the village clerk and treasurer. And of what I could find, the first constable, marshal, or police officer was J.T. Hayes. Norris Getz was the first justice of the peace. Well, you're probably wondering, why do you need a police officer and justice of the peace? Well, if, if they arrested somebody, they'd have to find the, the justice of the peace as soon as they could, and if he said, okay, we're gonna have a summons, we'll have a hearing later on. If they didn't have that hearing later on, what would happen is that the officer would have to take them to jail, and then they would bring them back down for the hearing later. Norris Getz would order several people to go to jail or um, issue a summons and they'd have to pay a fine. The need for an elected police officer authority has always been the rule in small communities and this included Oregon. The village of Oregon had one police officer. He would normally work nights since he had his regular job during the day. Sometimes they hired retired individuals that worked more hours because they were retired, usually walking on foot to do their jobs. Sometimes local citizens took matters into their own hands and to assist the police. In January 1887, the Oregon Rangers was formed. This was an anti-horse thief, a theft association that was organized and it was like a vigil vigilante group to stop the thefts in the area. Through the years, much has changed in police departments throughout Wisconsin and America. It necessitated by the growth of Oregon and the area, and it needed more protection and prevention to help those who choose to violate the rules of society. Of what I could find out, in 1922, Oregon had their first 24-hour police department. They had hired eight officers to do this. In the 1930 to 1940s, they were finally given uniforms to um, do, their, do their job. When I was hired in 1978, the squads that we had were police station wagons. And I was told in the 70s, the squads had in the back of the station wagons, we had stretchers. So if somebody got hurt or an emergency, we had to then take them to Madison, to the Madison hospitals. So there was always two police officers in that squad car to lift the stretcher and so on. 
there were certain nights that I worked from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. and I worked alone. So if you had an emergency and you had to go to somebody's house, you had to ask the people at the house to help you put the person on the stretcher and put it in a squad car, or you have had to call the fire department to, to come and help you get the person into the, the squad car. That was once again started in the early 70s, and, a, and in 1978 later became um, the ambulance took over that, that, that job for us. Currently today, Oregon has 20 officers. There's different positions in our police department. It, it is at 383 Park Street in the village of Oregon, one block away from here. There's currently one chief, one lieutenant, three patrol sergeants, one detective sergeant, and the rest are officers. There is even one canine officer that has just been renewed by the Oregon Police Department, and this will continue. The staff that runs the police department is one support services supervisor and two clerical staff. Is there anyone who can guess what the starting wage is currently for a police officer in Oregon? Okay, I know here we don't hear any responses. The current starting wage is $61,104. When I started in 1978, I made $804 a month. So if you want to be a police officer, join the Oregon Police Department. It is a well-run um, oil machine. It is a fantastic police department, and I was glad to be a part of that for 32 years. I want to thank you this evening for enjoying the, the four members of the Oregon Historical Society and our presentations, and once again, thank you. I want to thank everyone for attending online in, in this new way to share information. Um, I will be sending out information um, about the presentation as well as the link to the recording. Um, so thank you for joining us today.